Resuming debate, the Honorable Member for Victoria. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The word urgent is used in the motion before us, Mr. Speaker, and there's no doubt that's the correct word. I'd like to begin by quoting from Kai Nagata, who wrote in the Dogwood Initiative blog the following. One week ago, Vancouver residents woke up to the news that a grain freighter at anchor had leaked bunker fuel oil into English Bay. No reason to panic, right? Conditions were sunny and calm. There was hardly a breeze. A golden opportunity for the federal government to demonstrate its world-leading spill response. It's pretty clear now what a meaningless phrase that is. After watching federal officials trip over themselves for the past seven days, one thing is clear. It makes absolutely no sense letting Kinder Morgan run 408 crude oil tankers through Burrard Inlet every year. What spilled from the Marathasa was equivalent to 17 barrels of oil. Aframax tankers carry 800,000 barrels of oil. So what do everyday British Columbians do when we're told to expect more and more oil to keep washing up on our shores? We grab our clipboards and get to work, channeling our frustration into something productive. Something productive, Mr. Speaker, is to get rid of a government that has disdain for the coast of British Columbia, whose priorities are to spend, are to save $700,000 in closing down the Kitsilano Coast Guard Station, but has no trouble spending $7.5 million to tell us about their budget and their political triumphs. Mr. Speaker, we get it in coastal British Columbia. I live in an island riding. The number of people over the last two weeks who brought to my attention their disdain for this government, their, the priorities, as my colleague from uh, Skeena Bulkley Valley has said, are so skewed, I think on October the 19th, or as soon as possible, we have to get rid of a government that cares so little for coastal British Columbia. Closing a, a Coast Guard station might not sound like a big deal to people in central Canada. It is a big deal. And closing not just the Kitsilano Coast Guard, but also closing down the one in Euclid, the Euclid Marine Con Communication and Tra uh, Traffic Service Centre, and soon to uh, close down the Vancouver and Comox Marine Communication and Traffic Services Centre, cutting 25% of the Coast Guard staff in British Columbia. What does it mean in Euclid? Not far from where I live in Victoria. Well, it means, in the case of that particular station, an officer in charge, 17 marine communications and tra traffic service officers gone, five electronic technicians gone, two administrative support gone. Mr. Speaker, this was a minor spill in the grand scheme of things. And I think it was a wake-up call for everyone on our coast that those stations cannot be closed in good conscience. The cost-benefit analysis is just simply ridiculous. It's lunacy, Mr. Speaker, and people get that. They've cut. It wasn't, don't just take our word for it. The Auditor, the, the Auditor General, Commissioner for Sustainable Development, has proven 10 years ago, has said there's just no way we're prepared to deal with even a moderately sized oil spill. Even a moderately sized oil spill, but with the incredible increase in tanker traffic that's expected, how can we possibly cope if they continue to close these down? Their priorities are skewed, Mr. Speaker. And so, uh, the Kitsilano Coast Guard Station uh, was the subject of an Opposition Day motion, and I want to commend my colleague from New Westminster, Coquitlam and Port Moody, for his leadership on this. You know, he brought up Opposition Day motion forward back in June 2012. We have been, the official opposition has been all over this issue, all over this issue. And what has the government done? Nothing. In fact, the member for Pitt, the Conservative member for, member for Pitt Meadows, Maple Ridge Mission, in responding to a question from another one of my colleagues back then, assured the House that safety would not be affected by the closure. He boasted that the newly acquired hovercraft would, quote, better service this area. Better service this area. Apparently, hovercrafts just don't do oil slicks, Mr. Speaker. We now discover they just don't work. But they found that out. Thank goodness with a small spill, relatively speaking of toxic bunker fuel oil. The Minister of Fisheries and Oceans told Parliament that, quote, levels of search and rescue services in Vancouver will remain the same, close quote. Well, the folly of that particular claim was exposed last week when spill response didn't take the six minutes we're told by the former base commander it would have taken to get the ship out, to put the booms on the spill, etc. No, no, 
it, it, it could have t- taken 35 minutes from Sea Island Station. That didn't work either. It took six hours. And finally, 12 and a half hours later, they got to tell the people in Vancouver, people who were responsible for public safety beach closures, we got a tiny problem. Houston, we have a problem. Vancouver, we have a problem. Canadians, we have a problem. And this is directly, directly t- traceable to the choices that this government made to close down for $700,000 saving a Coast Guard station. And I want to commend my colleague for his leadership in bringing this up over and over again in this government, saying, no problem, don't worry, be happy. Well, Mr. Speaker, we are not happy in coastal British Columbia. We are very concerned. Why? Because, as Professor Tollison of the UVic Environmental Law Center has noted, this was an easy one. The vessel could have been much larger, the conditions far worse, the response time much longer. Let me explain. The location. Well, even shutting down, even setting aside the proximity to the shuttered station at Kitsilano, the spill occurred remarkably close to a Coast Guard station at Sea Island. What if it had happened midway between Victoria and Vancouver at Turn Point? Turn Point is a location identified at the National Energy Board hearing as the most challenging section of the route from Vancouver to international waters. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, <coughs> excuse me, the tidal conditions, the currents in that area can be devastating. <coughs> Secondly, the conditions. The spill occurred in daylight in calm, protected waters. What if it had happened at night when the currents were running strong? What if it happened in a storm? <coughs> the Marathasa is a brand new Japanese built grain carrier. It's large, but many of the transit the waters are much larger. What if instead this had happened to another vessel in a port that day? The 340 meter long container ship Hyundai Global, a vessel twice as large as the Marathasa in gross tonnage. And of course, there's a catastrophic scenario of a tanker full of bitumen. Now, the owners, the Marathasa, was flagged in Cyprus and owned by a Greek company, which is apparently fully cooperating with Canadian authorities to pay for the cleanup costs. However, the prevalence of flags of convenience make it very difficult, Mr. Speaker, to hold owners accountable. Who pays? And do I need to remind this House that the cost of a catastrophic oil spill, in the case of the Exxon Valdez, was $7 billion dollars? Apparently, the uh, maximum liability, uh, uh, you can pay up to $1.3 billion, but after that, it's the public that will apparently pay for these costs. And I'm not just talking cleanup costs, there's the ecological costs as well. And the substance, this was bunker oil, and I, gra- I, gra- I grant you that that is a serious uh, a toxic uh, uh, substance as well, but diluted, diluted bitumen is far worse. It, it, it would sink and it contains chemical dilutants that are highly toxic. So, Mr. Speaker, one of the many failings of the National Energy Board's rubber stamp review of the plans to expand the Kinder Morgan pipeline in Vancouver is its refusal to assess just how a number of chronic uh, spills that would happen would increase the risk if there was a, if there was a problem uh, with, with tanker collisions and this, and this sort. So there's been a complete breakdown, Mr. Speaker, a complete breakdown in communications that we saw in Vancouver. We had the, 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 the silly response by the, by, the, by the government officials that this was excellent. The response today has been excellent. We're going to get 80 percent of the English Bay spill. And as, a, as the former commander, uh, Frederick uh, Moxley said, former Coast Guard base commander said, that is simply not true, likely false. They're not going to get anything near that amount. And the other point that Dr. Ross of the Vancouver Aquarium discussed, he was one of the many DFO uh, scientists who were fired by the federal government as they cut millions in funding from the DFO in 2012. He said there's no official clarity around as to who is to monitor the effects of a spill. Yes, it's the Coast Guard's job to respond to the immediate aftermath, but we don't know who's supposed to be monitoring it. So he's on his own with the Vancouver Aquarium doing the monitoring. One hopes that the government has woken up and doing its own, but having more than 50 scientists lose their job, including Dr. Ross, whose marine toxicology program was shut down, one wonders whether that's going to be the case. 
So monitoring is a problem. We clearly find this excellent response was nothing of the sort, Mr. Speaker. The motion started with the word urgent. I commend to this House this motion. We've got to open those Coast Guard stations and not close the other and move on in British Columbia to protect our sacred coastal environment. Yeah. Thank you. The Honorable